Welcome to The Longer Game, the only show that's dedicated to the future of retail. We bring on real life people in the retail industry. We talk about their experiences. We share their stories. We apply it to what's currently going on in the market. And we look towards the future of retail. You could say it's retail reimagined. My name is Michael Marr. I run a customized done for you service agency called Cartology that helps brands win on Amazon. Now, while my expertise stems in the Amazon field, we bring on a wide array of guests because retail is expansive. You've got e-commerce. Yes, you've got marketplaces like Amazon. You've also got brick and mortar that is evolving. You've got logistics. You've got technology, finance. There are so many aspects to retail and it's complicated. So we're here to bring you the entire story. Do you think that you have an interesting story and you'd like to tell it on the podcast? Then go to thelongergame.com and fill out a form to be a guest on the show today. You can catch The Longer Game on any social channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and our website, thelongergame.com. We've got all awesome guests on this show, so that I will promise. Are you ready to hear more about the future of retail? Let's get down to business. Welcome everybody to The Longer Game. This is season three of the podcast that talks all about retail. We have all kinds of retail experts that come on, everyone from in-store brick and mortar to e-commerce. That's really the, the gamut right there. And today on the show, I have Brian Perkis, who is the senior e-commerce manager at Honest Paws with us. Welcome, Brian. Hey there. It's, uh, glad to be here. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, well, um, so I am senior e-commerce manager, so it is my job to make the website better. That's, that, that's it. I've been building websites for, for almost 20 years now. Um, I did the agency rotation as a developer, designer, digital marketer, SEO expert, you know, small business, small agency business, wearing lots of hat, but primarily was developer. So heavy, heavy down into the tech. Did that for a little over 10 years and then transitioned to in-house to e-com, having had worked on a bunch of e-commerce websites in the agency world and absolutely loving it. The, the, the puzzle of the hard data and the hard tech and the hard engineering of these, this code makes the button do that. The button has that KPI. I make these changes. Numbers go up, no, numbers go down. Heart, you know that engineering mindset of mine that mind that I have just love it very, very, very quantifiable. Um, but then you balance it with a lot of the harder to quantify of marketing, understanding the the customer, the product positioning. So it's a very hard science and soft science, and, and it, the, the the puzzle always changes based on the industry, new product releases. Uh, changes in advertising. Um, so there's always something new to learn, always something different to do. And that's that's <laughs> why I've got job security. There's there's always something new. So I'm always having to try and keep up with the changes of what's going on and what's, uh, what's going on in the e-commerce space and uh, test out new ideas, measure what we have going, figure out what's working and what's not working, and find new ways to make all of the KPIs better. Um, you know, e-commerce is a tech business. You know, we, we're, yeah, we're selling products. Yeah, we've got marketing. Yeah, there's SEO. You've got customer service and whatnot. But all of these different pieces flow through the website in one way or another. And so you have to have that good tech foundation in order for everything to work. If you If your website doesn't work, it doesn't matter how many ads you have. Doesn't matter how many customer support reps. It doesn't matter how good your your warehouse shipping is. It doesn't matter how great your copy is. Nobody's going to see anything without a functioning website in the the D 2 C e commerce space. It's funny. I've said the same thing about Amazon. Like it just gets more complex. So there's job security if we do our job well. Then it's like okay, right. well we can stay up on that. It's now become a much higher bar for people to to get into the space. And I actually saw from a direct to consumer standpoint. I saw a an interview with the the guy who started Native Deodorant. And someone was like, if you could start Native now, it was a couple of years ago even, would you do it? And he's like, no. The the customer acquisition cost via like Facebook ads and stuff like that, meta ads, way cheaper back then. It's more expensive now. It's it's different. So the times change and the complexities do help with from a job security perspective. 
I do think it's interesting that you're saying that people are in a tech business of e-commerce, which it's, it's all tech driven. Too bad for the guy who, I can't remember his name, but in like, I want to say 95, he said something like, well, you'll see that the internet is going to have as much impact on the economy as the fax machine. And he, of course, is quite wrong. Uh, I don't remember his name, but he definitely will go down with probably one of the worst quotes, at least in the last you know, 50 years or so. But it is very tech driven. And from from my perspective, when I think about Amazon, but really just customer experience, the best thing tech can do is get out of the way and make it really clean and easy for someone to to view a product or to to want to convert. And to your point, if you don't see the product or you can't get there quickly, you're never going to get that conversion. So all the marketing goes to waste, all the logistics can't kick in. So that's a big problem if your if your tech is not functioning the way that it's supposed to. Yeah, with with Amazon, you've got it, you know, easy in that the tech is handled by Exactly, Amazon. yeah. It means you're beholden to what they do, but you still have to at least keep up with what they're doing, but the website functioning and optimizing type of stuff, that's on them. Yes, you can optimize graphics and copy and you have control, but the tech itself is on them. In D2C e-commerce, you know, for me, that's my job. If if the website doesn't work, then then everything is 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 not working. Um, so you know, we've we've got this tech business and all of these, particularly in the um, when you're de- dealing with uh, paid ads, the expensive paid ads that we've got, then everything just becomes that much more compounding. You're having to fight for every every 10 cents, every penny to maximize your margin as much as possible. Yeah. And so all of these different uh, features, you know, your data tracking, how fast your website loads, um, you know, what what your remarketing um, data capture is, all of these different pieces of the puzzle um, just have that proportionally have that much more of an impact. And especially if you're trying to get your ROAS Um, even into like the negative ROAS. So you lose money on the first sale and you're trying to then make money on the second sale. Every piece of all of these systems has to be that much more fine-tuned, consistent, bug-free, et cetera. And then every tenth of a percent, every hundredth of a percent that you can boost to any of these various KPIs is now proportionally that much more impactful. So if we, you know, we're, we're trying to optimize everything across all of the funnels, all of the copy, customer experience, unboxing, shipping, everything. But like I said earlier, everything funnels through this D2C e-commerce website. So why do so many brands cut corners on this foundational center of the web, whatever analogy you want to pick? This is one of the most impactful things you can have for all of your KPIs and all of your revenue. So like invest, make, make a better website. Um, Why do you think people are cutting corners? Uh, perception and cost. Okay. Um, there's all of these tools from Shopify to Shopify apps to Facebook ads. Like, oh, just turn on your ad and let the algorithm make you make lots of money. Just turn on a store and add an app and everything will make you money. You don't need a developer. Just use the page builder and then everything, you know, how many, how many apps are out there? Use the pitch of, you don't need a developer. You can do it yourself. The Shopify ads are all about like, oh, you're like that one that was on for a long time of this gal knitting hats and a friend saying, you should sell those. And then it's like, she turns on a Shopify store. It just works. like. Yeah. yeah, it it doesn't it doesn't work that way. There's a lot of nuance to right. um, websites, and the nuance makes that much more of an impact when, like we said, all, the expense of ad acquisition, all of these things are that much higher. And when you're trying to grow aggressively, you're trying to uh, get those KPIs to the wire to that you know one ROAS or 0.9 ROAS or whatever whatever your target is. And so every bug. Every uh, bad data capture, um, every tenth of a wet second on your website load makes that much more of an impact. Um, you know, anytime I've hopped onto a new e-commerce store and performed an audit or joined a new brand or whatever for consulting or full-time hire, literally every single one of them has had Shopify apps on there that 
that brands are paying for that is loading on the website, but nobody's using it. Somebody installed it a while ago and they were using it and forgot about it. They tried it. They didn't like it. They never removed it, whatever it is. All of these websites, particularly within the Shopify app ecosystem, they have lots of bloat and all the more bloat you have, the more delicate everything gets. It's, it's a system. It's all of these things interconnected and they will um, start bumping heads with each other. The more complex everything gets, um, you, you want to simplify. Uh, there are multiple AB testing uh, out there uh, um, that have um, measured the impact of many different tests across many different websites. The most consistent split test that provides a positive impact on your conversion rate is removing stuff from your website. Interesting. Not adding, not even comparing like PDP pages. It's like, how do we get stuff mm -hmm. off that's just, like you said, causing bloat? Mm -hmm. Yep. But then within the market, you know, all of these apps are like, hey, install my app and your KPIs will do all of this stuff. Well, I'd say close to half of those apps aren't actually providing incremental revenue. They are just providing KPIs that make their app look good. And you now you add a dozen of these apps that are that are all throwing pop-up upon pop-up upon pop-up with the little floating things, all of this different just stuff onto the website. Yeah. That's not a good experience. I was just going to say, it's not a good customer experience. And it sounds like if you start with the the end goal of we just want you know to to have better performance without a why of like who's looking at it who does the performance matter for so you're not starting with the real end result of we want customers to come on and have a good experience with our brand purchase and come back if that's not the focus it's just we want better performance we want this stuff and there's no why behind it you're probably going to end up with a lot of apps and a lot of bloat on your site what are the kpis that matter not are what K what it's not what KPIs that we can measure positive impact for, um, because that's easy. I can guarantee a positive split test if I can pick my own KPIs that are irrelevant to business sure. goals. You know, um, LinkedIn added their um, the, those little puzzle games, which I'm enjoying Queens, but you know, I'm sure there's a guy who created this product and is like, hey, look, we have daily engagement um, boost because of these games. Well, for me personally, in the morning, I'll open up the app, I'll play the game and I'll immediately close it. And I don't interact <laughs> with anything else. So right. there's a boost to engagement, sure, sure. but there's no additional ad views. There's no additional revenue and, and whatnot. And like, you know, um, like Instagram, I don't know how many times there's like, Hey, somebody has these, uh, go view threads. Cause people are trying to follow you, follow you on threads. I'm never going to download threads, but we boosted engagement rate, like, but did it have a meaningful impact? So you can't just have a KPI for the sake of a KPI. It has to be something that will actually grow revenue or whatever. So we need, we need the good data. We need the good tech. We need to fight for every 10th of a percent, every 10th of a number, every 10, you know, 10th of a cent across all of these. Cause when you start doing the math of, but we increase conversion rate by 0.05%. We increase AOV by 0.1%. Reduce bounce rate, uh, you know, get 5% more visibility in the search engines. All of these things now compound on each other. And again, through the website, this tech stack funnels. If I increase any of these website KPIs, I just now increase the KPI for literally every single channel. So why, why, you know, we can spend all of these time on all these other channels and it's very common for the tech team to be the smallest team in e-commerce businesses based on what I've seen personally. Um, and, and, and why is that? Because the tech team, yes, tech developers are expensive. Yes, it is time consuming and expensive to maintain this tech stack, but that's where you can receive a multiplicative impact across all of your KPIs, which is going to help grow revenue. Are you saying that when you get into a business that you are like the rocket money of the developer world that you are like, you paid for this. You're not using it. You paid for this. You're not using it. Oh, that's funny. Um, that is absolutely true because literally every single website I've audited, um, mostly on Shopify, but even non Shopify sites, they have a bunch of stuff that they're not using. Um, even if they remove apps, um, apps install code onto web uh, Shopify apps will install code onto the website when you install it. 
and it won't remove it when you uninstall it. So there's just so much bloat. And so the first two to four weeks of any onboarding that I've had with the brand is just to go through everything and delete, 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 delete. You're saving money. Your website's loading faster. You've got less tech complexity. So you know, the more tech complexity you have by installing all of these apps and everything, every change that you want to make just takes that much more effort and debugging and testing and issues and all this stuff. So I just hack and slash and I save monthly costs and I increase all of the various KPIs and uh, it, it makes my job easy, but it's also like, you know, people should be doing this in the first place. Um, just regularly audit your apps. People should be, but my aunt always used to say, don't shit on yourself. Because, you know, what uh, <laughs> what people should be doing, what they are doing are often very different. But I, I, I agree. There is a I feel like especially in the age of generative AI and new tech that comes out, people think I want to integrate this, which I get. I get why, because it's hot. It's it's something people are talking about. It gets attention. But the real question, I think, should always be why? What are you wanting to do? And there's a conference that I was at and there was a gentleman there who had a really thoughtful answer about how we're integrating tech into things. And he just said, you should be thinking about what am I actually trying to, to solve here? What am I actually trying to get to? Then say, how do we go about adding this stuff in? And it feels like people are just either they're they're buying the marketing, which is great of you don't need a developer, or they're just saying, I want to just integrate this cool thing because, and no one's checking them and saying, yeah, but why do you want to do that? Yep. I don't know how many um, sales reps I have for these AI chatbot sales rep things. Uh, two to three a week are hitting me up trying to sell me just a chat GBT skin to slap on my website. Mm -hmm. And that's a great example of exactly what you're talking about. It's the new hot thing. Oh, I need to keep up with the Joneses and add these new things. And they say they're going to have all these KPIs and all of that type of stuff. But if you don't integrate it well, and you don't feed it enough copy because you don't have sufficient copy or you just threw on whatever one that had the greatest marketing and it doesn't connect to your systems to pull all the relevant copy, that chatbot can't sell you a product without being fed enough. So you have to have all of that type of stuff and all of the things working together. Um, otherwise, it's going to be worse. I don't know how many websites I've gone to to be like, hey, I have here is the exact specific super detailed explanation of the issue I'm having with your product and the AI chatbot is like hey did you read article number 5 of 12 on our and it's like no that's not relevant let me talk to a human and now I'm frustrated and I'm, I'm having a bad experience and I want to leave yeah just because they had to have the AI chatbot that they weren't ready for yeah again just like why why do you want to do something what is it going to help and or what's the end result and then is the thing that I'm wanting to implement actually going to help? Because it, it may not. Maybe it's like, you know what? We actually could do something a lot simpler. Or maybe it's what we need to do is going to be even more complex. And we need something that's going to cost more. But if you don't know why you're doing it in the first place, then you're just you're adding stuff to your website. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you can doesn't mean it's going to be a positive impact. And just because that particular sales rep gave you a good sales pitch doesn't mean that particular app is the best for you. I always do a, a market analysis of any functionality and app and see what are the competitors out there, even if it just increases confidence and we made the right choice, that, that that's completely valid. We're making a commitment to an app that we're going to have for ideally years. We want to make sure we're making the right decision and getting the best bang for our buck. I think... I I think that makes a lot of sense. And when I'm in a sales conversation with a brand, I, you know, I expect that they're looking at other agencies. And my encouragement is always like, take a take a look around. Like I think you should. And to your point, maybe we don't go with this other tech, maybe we don't go with this other agency, but now I have confidence that I'm making the right decision. And I'm so confident in what we're doing, I can't force people's decisions, unfortunately for myself, but I can say, look, go out and look at what what's out there. Do do your research. You will be hard pressed to find someone that can actually give you the level of strategy that you need, and actually know how Amazon works, communicate with you well, and give you a high level of service, and go out and do the execution. Like that's very very hard to find. And if it is findable, it's like one or two of my friends, and maybe I don't tell you about them. Maybe I do tell you about them, but 
there's like a limited number of people that can actually really do that. But go out and take a look. And and that's a that's a common problem you talked about of sales rep giving a good pitch. I'm in sales. I do sales for my company. I love it. But there's a lot of stuff that can be shortchanged in that moment of, hey, I have a really good hook, but I don't know what your problem is. I'm going to get on and just pitch you on my thing. And I, I cannot tell you how many times people that run softwares in an initial discovery call, you've already lost me when you start to jump into a demo. And it's not because they don't want to see your product, but I read a book called Gap Selling. I've talked about it in my podcast before. Really great book. It helps explain what the sales process should actually look like. When you tell me all about your, I have problem knowledge as, as, your, as your, your buyer or your potential client, your prospect. I have problem knowledge. You have solution and or service knowledge. As soon as you give me your service knowledge, I don't need you anymore. You don't have my problem knowledge. You don't know anything about what's going on with me. And I can say, cool, great, thanks, and walk away. And you can say, well, what happened? We gave you a great demo. You don't know what my problem is. So like, you have to know what that is, and that requires questions and stuff. So the the sales versus ops thing is, a, I think, a common issue. There's sales can sell you really well, but can the operations actually fulfill on that? And that's there's often a mismatch there. Completely agree. I've seen that many times over on on my side of you know the the opposite side as as the person being sold to. I try whenever I hop on a call with a salesperson, I always try and shortcut everything as much as possible. I'll be like, "This is my background. This is my level of knowledge. This is the problem we're trying to solve." how can you solve me for it? And within 30 seconds, I know whether or not this is going to be a productive call or not, because if the sales rep is meeting like, oh, okay, let me go through every single page of my slide deck in order, because that's my pitch, because you know, I don't know my product, then it's like, okay, well, the 99% likelihood, this is not going to be helpful. But if they're like, oh, okay, well, let's see, let's see, skip, 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 skip. Ah, here we go. See this, now this, this is the information that's relevant to your problem. And they start diving in this call. Oh, this is going to be a good, this is going to be a good conversation. Yeah. I feel like before I would ever show, I mean, I typically were like doing an audit so that takes time to like get to that actual recommendation portion of stuff. But it's very, I, I, I'm never jumping in and saying, well, let me tell you all about what we do, blah, 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 blah. I will say, you know, look, regardless of how they came, like we, we run a, I run a full channel agency. So it's management of Amazon where we're handling everything from catalog to creative to advertising. In order for me to really be able to determine if I can help you, I'd like to ask you some questions to find out more about what's going on. So can you, can you tell me this? And when people either jump to, just tell me what the cost is, or, well, I want to know about you. Like, you pitch me. I'm like, this is a broken conversation. Like, I, I will never give you a recommendation if I have no idea what's going on. And I, there are times when I like a rep and I'm like, look, here's what I'm facing. Here's what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes they'll, they'll take it and that will help them. But when people just jump right into it, you're 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 making it so that you're selling yourself out of a uh, of an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's unfortunate because they could even have a great solution, but but they're missing out. When it comes to yeah, AB, you got to be able to sell. You it. got you got to be able to to know the problem and then sell against that problem. So when it comes to AB testing on sites, what are some of the things that you feel like people should be measuring, and what would be a, a good result? In, in the case of an A-B test? So when when we're testing, and this can, this conceptually it will apply to an actual literal split test or as well, or just a let's launch something and, and see, see what impact it does, we want to try and narrow down the data analysis as much as possible. Um, let's say we launch a, uh, a split test, the, the button color. We're just doing the classic add to cart button color change split test um, and we launch it and our measurement is um, conversion rate well there are a lot of steps throughout the entire funnel between um, visit and conversion rate and the add to cart button color somewhere in the middle so um, you know let's say we've got a uh, a something something happens and we have this big spike in abnormal traffic i don't know something goes viral and we have a massive increase in visits of unqualified traffic. Well, our KPIs went down and all of this bad stuff and all, you know, and, and now we've, we've got 
inconclusive data or incorrect data because we're trying to look at the full funnel with everything um, when we've got this data source that or this uh, influx of traffic that is messing with the data. We want to narrow it down to what is most relevant. Um, in this case, we we're not wanting to measure conversion rate. We're, we're wanting to measure add to cart. I was going to say, I think like because, click through or add to cart, and that would make right. way more sense. Yeah, we, exactly. We want to measure what is the impact of this button. And so, on a split test, we sure we want to pay attention to conversion rate, but we want to monitor the add to cart rate with this test. When we're doing things like uh, measuring, you know, if we're say say let's we rebuild and launch a new header. Um, because we're doing an iterative run through of everything. Um, if we launch the new header and we send out a whole bunch of emails at one time, then we've got all of this polluted data. So we want to try and narrow it down. So if we're ex it's, if it's not a true split test because we don't have the time or the tech stack or whatever, and we're just changing these elements, like, well, let, let's narrow it down. Clavio traffic is going to be lots of returning customers and it's going to you know have a big influx. So filter out those customers or you know or or separate them like let's look at normal traffic without clavio customers and like let's look at clavio customers we want to narrow down the funnel by by traffic source by by product focus we want to create these these isolations as much as possible um, and that goes for testing as well as general monitoring if we're looking at conversion rate um then there are a whole bunch of factors. We're just monitoring conversion rate across the website. Um, so, you know, if conversion rate goes down, I get a frantic call from, you know, the head being like, hey, what's all the things are bad and everything's whatever, yada, yada, yada. It's like, well, I, I don't have enough data to look. It could be that an email went out. It was a bad email and nobody converted and that's why. So the source isn't something wrong with the website. The source is, you know, an issue with the email. Or it could be that, you know, uh, the add to cart button broke. I, I don't know. And so the more we can segment and isolate every stage of the funnel, every traffic source and cross pollinate accordingly, then we can go at it um, and figure things out. And if we're having uh, the you know the email marketer watching his data and, you know, he, um, the PPC marketer watching their data and I'm watching my data, um, you know, it's like, okay, so add to cart broke and we log in and everything's wrong, you know, weird. I noticed add to cart rate plummeted. Um, and let's, let, oh, let's, let's get more specific. Let's say it's an iOS specific bug. So the PPC person logs in and notices that um, Instagram ad data is absolutely horrible because they're all you know, mostly on iOS. I log in and see add to cart rate is all horrible. And, um, you know, so we, and email marketers like, oh, well, everything's kind of fine because emails are on desktop. And so we've got all of these different segments that are all narrowing down to a, sing a single focus. And now every different department has a different plan of attack. For me, I need to fix this button. For the PPC person, temporary stop all iOS ads. Um, for the email person, let's reschedule the email from today to tomorrow. So we all now have different action plans that are relevant to what we're going on. So the more we slice and dice and segment data um, across channels and across funnels, the better we can pay attention to what's going on for something going wrong or something going right. I could, if we're looking at say conversion rate um, and still, I, on my perspective site-wide, I could see just a small little blip that increases. But if we're looking at a funnel base, uh, funnel, and we're looking at ads, and it's like, oh well, this ad with this product with this flow, these are good. So we need to double down on this. Let's double, triple, quadruple ad spend for this particular ad campaign, and we would have completely missed that effectiveness of to what we should double down on, or maybe a product. Maybe a product is just suddenly doing well, so we need to double down on the product. And so I'm wa watching by channel and by funnel, by product, um, that type of stuff so we can see what's working and what's not working. So add to cart rate for this product is going great. Add to, add to cart rate for that product is not going great. So something is resonating well with this one. Let's focus and double down on and in increase ad spend on that product. And let's look at this product and figure out why it's not, you know, converting bad graphics, bad copy, bad positioning. Maybe it's just a bad product and we need to not renew it. Maybe you can run an A-B so test on to. the PDP in that sense and say, do we need mm -hmm. to change that? And then if it's like both suck, then to your point, yeah, maybe we just 
get mm-hmm. rid of this product. Yep. S- Store wide KPIs are great for general business health. They give us very little action items on what does it mean? What do we do now? What do we double down on? What's working? What's not working? I doesn't know. So you need to filter down as much as possible. Um, there's a tool out there. It's a Shopify specific tool called Edge Mesh. Um, highly, highly, highly recommend it. Jacob Loveless, amazing guy. They make an amazing this podcast. Product. Is actually sponsored they, by Edge Mesh. So I'm just kidding. Oh, hey. <laughs> maybe now. Awesome. Maybe now it will be. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> um, but uh, the um, the tool has great performance boosting stuff, but then has amazing analytics app okay. that has AI that will flag these types of things and as well has, as, um, has all sorts of different ways to slice and dice the, the, all of those funnels. And so you can dig in and all of these different way, things that I've said that you should pay attention to. It shows every step of the funnel. It shows every funnel path. It shows every marketing channel path. And so now you can figure out all of these. And then the AI is also watching it. This is an actual use of a good AI, not that chatbot that we were talking about earlier, because you've got all of this data. And so if we're looking at score wide and you know, I can, I can look at all of these things, but now I'm spending 45 minutes to dig down to find something or AI, what AI does really well is process large chunks of data faster than human. So it can look through all of this and it will notice abnormalities and flag something is going up, down or normal. And now we can identify faster that, hey, this ad is working well, increase spend. Something broke and you know, these KPIs went down, so go fix it. Um, bad ad, bad button, bad whatever. Um, we, we need to be able to uh, yeah, narrow that focus and double down on what's working. There's two things that I hear out of what you're saying. One is the AI comment, which I think is, is, is super sage. I see AI, a lot of people are worried about AI taking jobs. And I'm like, I just don't think you know what it's actually capable of doing. It's taking generative AI, like a chat GBT. It's literally taking everything that's ever been or it has access to and compiling that. It's not creating something new. It's There's no new ideas that are coming from it. It's not a sentient being. Although I loved iRobot, we're not quite to that, you know, to that to that place yet. But I get the the fear is very palpable. And that makes me think of something like the industrial revolution. People were worried, oh, okay, it's going to, you know, uh, the the assembly lines and the machines are going to take our jobs. Sure, in a way, but it's actually going to do that job better. And now it's going to allow you to do a different job like do I need to maintenance the machine? Do I need to design product better? And so when I think about what AI can and cannot do, in this instance, it's processing things way faster so that now the human who is interacting with this, it would take someone forever to probably try and figure that out. And now AI can do it super quick and say, hey, Brian, here's a problem. And then you can say, is this relevant or not? So that was one thing, just using AI in the right context. And don't worry, people, I disagree with Elon. It's not going to take everyone's jobs. but We'll see. I mean, I'm I'm willing to be wrong. And the second thing is, we're just talking about segmentation, I think, across analytics and all that stuff. And I love that because every time I go in and audit an ad account for someone on Amazon, the biggest problem I see, and anyone could go and fix this. Most people just don't, or they're not thinking about it, or maybe they're concerned about what the outcome would be. But you have to know how the platform works, whether it's Shopify, Amazon, et cetera, you stuff a hundred keywords inside a campaign. You just do the math on that. Let's say your budget is a hundred dollars a day for that campaign for a hundred targets. And let's say Amazon evenly distributes and shows these targets along with your products or your products against these targets. It won't by the way, but let's say it does. And let's say your CPC is a dollar. It's not going to be a dollar, but let's just say it is for easy math. You now get one click across every single target that you get. How many people do you know that have a 100% conversion rate? Very, very few. So you're now basically saying, I'm never gonna get a sale on anything. And the reality is something spends, Amazon will prioritize that. They have their own uh, ad algorithm that's separate from search and wants to see that you can actually sell and convert. So they'll start to prioritize that or at least prioritize what's, what's spending. And if you segment, you have much more control and you can say, I advertise this term. And it's not going to be everything, but I advertise this term or this grouping of, let's say, five to 10 terms. And I showed one of these two products. I now know how those worked in comparison to this other campaign I ran with these other terms. 
and the same products. And now I know what's going to perform better. Like that segmentation, it requires you to track data one. And then it also requires you to put that data into buckets and then say, what action should I take based on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then when you segment it, like with your, your exam, uh, you can better analyze and double down on the success and cut down what isn't with your example of a hundred dollars, $1, hundred positions, like, you know, evenly split, not all hundred of those keywords are going to be as useful as, as each other. So with that big of a spread, you don't know which one is the better intent. You can speculate, but you don't know. So if you can split everything out into smaller and smaller buckets to isolate and pay attention to what's working with groupings, you can see that I thought this was, you know, this group was going to be good, but it's, it's like only okay. So we'll keep some spend there. But this one, I'm surprised here. This is where I'm getting my higher conversion rates. So now we can increase spend here and double down on that success. And that's, that's how you increase efficiency and scale faster. And you can't, when you have some targets performing well and others that suck, you can't just increase spend for one inside of a huge campaign like that. It has to be segmented in order to, to do that. So I think it's a great place to end it, man. I, it's always a good conversation when I talk with you. If people want to know more about what you're doing, where would they find you? Bearing yourself out from under all the extra apps and stuff that you've gotten unloaded <laughs> off people's pages. Yeah. Where, what would you, uh, where, where do people find you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn at, uh, at Brian Perkis. Um, I don't do too much of the social media gamut. Um, I post occasionally there. I kind of go through spurts where I post more often and don't and kind of go through rotations of talking about either leadership or e-commerce and all of that and or productivity. So I kind of bounce around on all of that type of stuff, depending on how busy I am in life. So you can find me there, um, reach out and contact with me. I mean, I, I, I am available for uh, site audit services. Um, um, I won't audit a website that is in direct uh, competition with my uh, employer, <laughs> but uh, otherwise I'm, I'm happy to take a look at your website and provide some suggestions. I've got a very good track record of making e-commerce brands, lots and lots of money. Um, so if you need help, I can help you out. Um, otherwise, you know, I like talking shop. So find me on LinkedIn and, and let's, let's talk tech. I enjoy it. I love hearing that tech in a, in a tech world that you should be investing in, not skimping on, but that's it people. We don't have anything else for you. So it's time to go. We'll see you next time. All right. That was the show. What did you think? That was the longer game. We would love for you to share the show with other people and to leave us a review of the show. So go to iTunes, go to Spotify, you can go to YouTube, comment, leave a review and share this on any social channels that you are active on and wherever you have influence. We want to share this story and stories like it to as many people as possible. Do you have a compelling story and do you want to come on the podcast and talk about it and you're in the retail industry? Then go to thelongergame.com, fill out a form, and we will contact you about coming on the show. You can find us on any social channels, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and you can go to our website, thelongergame.com, to actually read all of these episodes in blog form and text because we know not everyone's going to listen. This podcast is brought to you by my agency, Cartology. We are a customized done for you service agency that helps brands win on Amazon. It is super complex selling on the Amazon marketplace. We help simplify that for you. This podcast is also brought to you by Podcastify Me. They are a full service podcast production company that designs podcasts around people who are paid for their advice. That is coaches. If you want someone to help create, strategize, and distribute your podcast to the masses, go to podcastify.me to find out more. I've so enjoyed that you've been a part of the conversation and that you've given up your time to hear these people's stories. We'd love for you to share. If you want to find out more, just go to thelongergame.com. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay blessed. And until next time, cheers.